Many people struggle with the Bible. They know the Bible is valuable, they know it's important, but they're not sure where to start, they get stuck somewhere in the middle, and as a result, they end up missing out on the life-changing power of God's Word. And Scripture is full of all kinds of stories that tell this one story. God is a rescuer. God is a redeemer. God is a provider. God is a deliverer. Hey, good morning. Man, we're so glad you're here. Hey, is it, it's fun worshiping God, isn't it? What could be better than that? I'll tell you. One day, when you get to do that with every tribe and every nation, but you get to do it in his presence. I mean, this is really, this is really good. It was really good. But to be able to have that experience is going to be even better. I always tell James, I try to tell him at least once a week, I said, you know, I think you ought to consider like a career in uh, just being a worship pastor. I, I think that there's something there. You know, I think you could do it. And uh, then I always pick on him because the people that God has brought here, uh, whether it's a musician or just vocalist, just so grateful for them, man. Aren't, aren't you grateful for them? Yeah. Grateful for them. Yep. That's God's goodness to us, and uh, so thankful for that. Hey, if you're a guest with us, glad you're here. We are uh, in week three of a series called The Good Book, where we are over the next few weeks looking at 40 different chapters revealing the Bible's biggest ideas. And up until this point, what we've done is we've read 10 chapters revealing these two ideas. The first idea is that in the beginning, there was God, and he was life. Okay, God is life. The second uh, idea, the one that we talked about last week uh, after reading through some chapters, was that God is good, and let's see if we remember, God is good when? All the time. Well, he's good all the time, and I completely failed, because really last week the major message was God is good when life gets messy. Yeah. Oh, you're like, oh yeah, I remember that. You know? But you know, really what that communicates is, man, you guys are so good, your life doesn't get messy, does it? Mine does, man. I mean, you know, I'd have a good, God had to have a good conversation with me even this morning just saying, Mike, 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 Mike. God is good when life gets messy. Well, today we're going to talk about this third idea, this third theme that runs all throughout Scripture. And this week as you read through Darren's book, it, that the chapters of the Bible and the stories that are told are going to communicate this idea. But I thought to set it up, I would just tell you a story. I'd use a story to set up this theme. Years ago, uh, I had an opportunity to go on my first mission trip that was outside of our country. Now, I've been to Kentucky before in the backwoods and the back mountains, and you could make an argument that maybe that is out of this world. But I actually had to get on a plane and step foot on another continent, and I went with Compassion International down to the country of Guatemala. And if you're not familiar with Compassion International, what they do is their whole mission is to release people from poverty in Jesus' name. Now, poverty is more than financial because you can be emotionally depleted. You can, you can be impoverished spiritually, emotionally, physically, and yes, spiritually. And so uh, what Compassion does is they work with the local people and they release people from poverty in Jesus' name. And one of my favorite memories from this trip was is that none of us understood what anybody was saying. It was fascinating. All we did all the whole time is we all talked, not knowing what we were saying, and we just smiled back at each other. And really what that communicated to me in that moment was that love is big. Like love is universal. And that even though we couldn't understand one thing one another was saying, we enjoyed one another's time. And we knew that those smiles were driven by God's love for us. That was one of my favorite memories. And so as I was leaving country and I was thinking about some of my takeaways, I wrote down three takeaways. Now, not because they're pastor. I'm a pastor. And you don't have to write these th three things down because it's not on your outline. But these were the three takeaways. One is the first takeaway was that God, who is with us here this morning, the same God that we worship this morning, is with them there. The same God who woke up with you this morning, who woke up when you woke up and he was there, he's with people who are going to sleep right now, and he's with them. The second takeaway that I had from that trip was, man, the God who knows me, and he cares for me, and he made them, or made me, 
He made them, and he knows them, and he cares for them. The third thing that I remember from that trip, the third takeaway that I had from that trip, was that the cross, that Christ's death and resurrection has got the power to set people free on a global scale. You see, the same gospel message that I heard in Sunday school, that God made me and that Jesus sacrificed his life for me and that he rose from the dead, and that message that transformed my life transformed their lives. And it's so big and it's so powerful that it's not limited. It's not inhibited by language barriers or geographical locations. So when you get home from a mission trip, what is a question that people ask? They want to know, how was it? How was it? Like, Mike, how was it? And this was my response to him. God is really big. I said, God, you guys, is really big. You see, the same God who is here with us now is there with them right now. And the same God that made you and me and cares for me, he made them and he loves them and he cares for them. And the same gospel message that we're going to share with people this week that transformed our lives, that has the power to transform our lives this morning, transformed their lives. I was like, God is really big. And that's the third theme that goes all throughout Scripture. And that's the theme as you read through Darren's book this week, as you dive into these five chapters that we get to dive into every week. The theme this week is that God is really big. And let's be honest, as Americans, we like things big, don't we? We want things big. Like sometimes we might, we, we want a big God, but there's times where, let's just be honest, we only want a little of him. We like things big. Want big. In fact, we even have a phrase that conveys this message. It's more of a motto, as it were. We say, if big is good, then bigger is better. You probably said that about some stuff. It's like, fellas, if you, draw, if you own a pickup truck, even if you haven't done this to yours yet, you would agree with this statement. That if a pickup truck is big, that is good. But if your truck is bigger... That is better. Ladies, this is true of you. And in fact, I bet that this is one of the first thoughts and one of the things that you most anticipated to when you walked into the house or the apartment that you now live in, you wanted to go see one room in that house. And it's an important room to you. It's a closet. Because if a, if a walk-in closet is big, a bigger one is better. better. It's better. And I just have to say this because somebody was crazy enough to give me a microphone. Um, come September, if chasing big bull elk is good, chasing bigger bull elk is better. Oh, my goodness. It's just one of the few states you can say that and people will applaud. It's crazy. It's because you, know, you know the biblical truth that bigger is better. However, bigger, it's a double-edged sword because sometimes bigger isn't always better, is it? Bigger debt isn't always better. The economists, the strategists, you look at it on a national scale, like our, our national spending out of control, our debt is bigger, and that's not necessarily better. And if you feel that presence in your own home, you know the burden that's associated with it, and so sometimes bigger isn't always better. We're like, you know, we try to avoid mistakes. We go to a lot of lengths to try to avoid mistakes because we know that mistakes aren't better. And so we don't want to make the big mistakes because bigger when it comes to making mistakes isn't better. I remember one time my friends invited me to, uh, to go to a place called Miller's Ice Cream. And so we were going to go to Miller's Ice Cream and they said, just bring your appetite. And I got there and, and uh, I said, hey, uh, all right, let's get some ice cream. And they said, no, no, no. I said, okay, and this should have been like, this should have been like warning number one. They said, today we're going to eat a Miller's Mountain. I was like, what is Miller's Mountain? They said, well, it's 12 scoops of ice cream, and you get to pick which kind it is. And hey, if you get to eat, if you eat it, they'll give you a free t-shirt. They'll put your name on their marquee sign for one week, and the ice cream is free. Now listen, they were casting a powerful vision in this moment. But the second red flag should have been the fact that they weren't eating. I was the only one eating. <laughs> so I ordered, you know, like, I, but here, I got to be fair, fair to myself here. 
I was smart enough to ask the question, what happens if I don't eat this? They said, well, you won't get the t-shirt, and you won't, get, you won't get your name on the sign. Okay, okay. And they said, you'll have to pay for the ice cream. How much is that going to cost? 30 bucks. Okay, see, I was smart enough to ask the question. I was not smart enough to just, you know, listen to wisdom. So I ordered the ice cream. And about halfway through, I knew that there was no possible way I was ever going to get through this thing. And I started to realize that I had paid $30 for a stomach ache that would rival an appendectomy without anesthesia. It hurt. And you know what I walked out of there saying? Bigger isn't better. Because sometimes bigger isn't better. Hemorrhoids. Some of you might be saying, why did he say that? But you would have a hard time arguing that truth. That is a true statement, all right? Sometimes bigger isn't better. Now here's where this whole thing comes together. When some of you guys walked in here today, and when, you, when, the, when some of you walked in here today, and you heard me say that God is big, that felt really good to you. Because your entire life, or at least you've come to know that God is good, and so if God is good and he is big, that is a good thing because his love for you is really good and it's really big and you trust that, you know that, you live in that. So God being big isn't scary. But I bet that there's people who will come to our church this weekend, maybe even in this service, that you didn't grow up in a loving home and so... so the idea of God being our heavenly father, when you think about your father and maybe he wasn't good to you and I say that God is big and you relate that, that's not a necessarily a good feeling to you. Maybe you didn't know, maybe you don't know God or maybe, maybe you, you never grew up and you didn't know your dad and so when I say God is big, that could be terrifying, that could, be, that could create anxiety. The whole point being, based on our perception and our understanding of God, God being big, we come at that different ways. Which is why it is so, 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 and I'll say it one more time. Which is why it is so important to know God in his word. To actually know him. Now, uh, the reason I say that and to know him through his word is because you can believe in God. You can trust him. You can believe that his word is 100% credible. And I'll just give you proof. I'll give you evidence of it. This week in the Holy Land, they made a discovery where they believe they found, I don't know if it was a parchment of paper or if it was on, on stone. Some of you will be aware of this. Some of you won't. But they actually found a document with uh, what they believe is the prophet Isaiah's signature on this parchment or on this artifact. They found that. And so what I'm telling you is Isaiah wrote an entire book. They are finding historical evidence of this that just speaks to the grander picture. You can trust God's word. And all throughout his word, we see that God is consistent. We can know him. We know that God is consistently consistent. And here's what he's consistent in. If you were to, if you, when you open up your Bibles, if you go to the book of Genesis, you can see right away that God wants to have a relationship with us. If he wanted a relationship with us then, he wants one with us now. Not so that he can scare the thunder out of us, but though, so that we would know the goodness of him, so that we would know how good his love is. You can, in the same chapter, you can read that God hated sin then. Guess what God still hates today? Sin. We read all throughout scripture, God is consistent. If he was patient then, guess what he is today? He's still patient. If he was slow to anger then, guess what he still is today with us? He's still slow to anger. You see, God is consistent, which is why when we come to him, we can know that he's good. And that's why when I say the theme for today, that God is big, that you can know that that's actually a good thing. But I just want to ask the question because it was the question that I wanted to know. When I looked at the theme this week, when I was getting ready this week, and I saw these three letters that God is big, the question you may have even asked yourself as we've talked this morning is I just wanted to know, okay, God, 
How big are you? With a curious mindset. Okay, you're big. And I believe that that's a good thing. But God, how big are you? And then I was like, how am I going to convey that? With the exact same thing I've been talking to you about this morning with Scripture. So if all of you, whether it's on your U version, whether it's a tablet, whether you're online, whether you've got your smartphone, or whether you got a hard copy of the B-I-B-L-E, Let's crack that thing and let's get to Psalm 139 because we're going to read this passage of Scripture today that conveys God is big and that is actually a really good thing. We're going to look at different verses differently today, uh, just meaning we'll spend more time with some than others. That is me and that is not uh, the tech guys. Our tech guys are awesome. I can screw a handshake up better than anybody I know. I can screw a microphone up better than anybody I know too. John, I think we're good. We're good. If i got to take my coat off, I'll take it off. Uh, all right, let's look at it. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. Let me tell you, like God can search David. David's the one who wrote this. God can search David like that. Just like, just like that. Oh, man, the right hand works better than the left. God can search David like that. But it actually took David time to understand that. See, God could search out his thoughts. He could search out his desires. He could search his heart. And he knew David. God can do that with us like this. But in order for us to have a relationship with somebody, that takes what? It takes time, doesn't it? takes intentionality, takes making a priority. David had made his relationship with God a priority. And he stopped to consider how well God knew him. He's like, God, I know that, you, that you've searched me and that you know me. And because, because David knew God and because of that relationship, he was able to pen some words that I'd like to just, sh again, share with you, convey how big God is. First of all, God is so big. If we just go back to verse 1. I don't, go back to verse 1. There we go. See, if God can do that with David, he's so consistent, he can do that with you. And he can not just do that with you, but he can do that with the person sitting next to you. But you see, if I were to count everybody in here, I'd have to go like one, two, three, four. See, God can do that all at once with everybody in here, but also all around the world. It conveys the idea God can search us and know us, and boom, he's got it like that. He's just really big. Isn't that awesome? All right, let's go ahead and check this, man. I don't know who that little one was, but that was awesome. I want to have that faith, childlike faith. Okay, so David goes on to say, you have searched me. And notice that when he writes down and searched me, there's no fear there. God, you've searched me, and you know me. Like, you know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. I bet when you woke up this morning, one of your first thoughts was, who's making the coffee? And I bet the second thought was, who gets the shower first? But did you know that when as soon as your eyes opened, God was already searching your heart. He saw when you rose. He was aware. He's so big. He's so all-knowing that he saw you get up. He was a part of that. He saw you starting to get ready. You like, you know me when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. God is so big, he perceives our thoughts from afar. And listen, I know that we're in church. So I know that we're only supposed to have good thoughts. So I'll start with this. Sometimes I don't have good thoughts. Is there anybody else with me? No. This isn't meant to freak you out. It's just meant to be a truth. God saw those too. God perceives our thoughts from afar. Our hopes, our dreams, our insecurities, our frustrations the good stuff about us, the bad stuff about us. And let me be clear, we can let him know those and not have to be afraid. He loves us. He knows all of it. 
and he loves us. Okay, he knows when we rise. He perceives our thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. Like God knows why you're getting in the store. Or he knows why you're heading out. He knows why you're going, why you're coming. He knows the motives. He knows the things driving all of that. He knows the insecurities. He knows the hopes. He knows the passions. He, he's got all of it. He says, before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it. How, how much does he know it? Completely. Okay, again, I'm not trying to freak you out. But anytime you encourage somebody and you use the power of words to bless somebody, before you finish a thought, God can finish your sentence. But that is a two-sided coin. Because the next time you want to swear at somebody, God knows how to finish. He could finish that. He knows what you're going to say. And you're thinking, well, people at church aren't going to know that. They're not going to know that I cussed somebody out or thought about cussing somebody out. Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter what I think about you. It doesn't matter what the person next to you thinks about you. Do you know who it matters with that knows? God. He sees that. He sees it. Just think about that the next time you're ready to rip somebody a new one. And then I love this. You hem me in behind me and before me and you lay your hand upon me. One of my favorite memories is a kid. Is my dad sometimes on my right shoulder or sometimes both? I can remember what it feels like. He would come and he would put his hands on my shoulder. And he would not have to say anything to me because just the action of him putting his hands on me communicated, my dad is with me and my dad loves me. And look at what David was able to say, is that you hem me in behind me and before me. You lay your hands upon me. And so God has got us all encompassed. And this was somebody else's thought. This is not my thought, but I just thought it was so good. That if God is, if he has hemmed me in before me, behind me, all around me, that there is nothing that can come into my life that God did not give permission to be there. Because he's a protective father. He's a loving father. And if he was that way for David, David knew that. David knew that, man, God is all-knowing. If he's that for David, he's that for us too. Because why? Because God's consistent. He is big. And this morning, you have got a heavenly father who loves you so much, man. He just kind of puts his arms around you on your shoulders, and he leads and he guides. God being big is a really good thing, isn't it? Because he's not just doing that for us this morning. He's doing that for the people down the road. He's doing that for the church in Guatemala. He's doing that for the church in Lebanon. On a global scale, God does this. And he doesn't start like his arms aren't moving like this. He can just do it all at once because he's that good and he's that big. But here's the other thing I want us to say. is like The other thing that I want us to know is that if God... Is uh, And I, I know if you're on an outline, forgive me, the tape playing in my head. I'm driving you cuckoo right now. Uh, the point that David is driving home here is that God is omniscient, which means he is all-knowing. God is all-knowing. See, God just isn't all-knowing about us. God is all-knowing about all things. And so there's nothing that catches God off guard. There is nothing that he isn't aware of. There is nothing that he doesn't know. And so if you've got a question, man, you can stop asking Siri. You can stop talking to Alexa. Ask God. Now listen, Alexa's good, man. Siri's good. There's, we got to go to Google sometimes because we just don't know and God's given us Google. All right, there's some good things there. I'm just saying that there are some questions that we have of God that we're not asking because either we're embarrassed or we think we ought to know or maybe we're just stubborn. We can ask him. Why? Because he's all-knowing. And if God is all-knowing about David, he's all-knowing about us. And if he's all-knowing about all things, like us, he's all-knowing about all things. I'm going to go for this in 30 seconds. There are roughly 6 billion people on the planet. There are 206 recognized uh, governments in the, around the world. There are roughly 7,200 different languages. There are, there are roughly 57 and a half million miles of land mass with people filling it all. And I just want to say this. God knows. God knows. It's not too big for him. He's all-knowing. 
That's a good thing. He's really big. All right, the second thing that I want to look at, David, David asked a great question. He just said, you know, uh, in verse 7, uh, you can read this. I know we skipped over verse 6, but God being big, look at what he says in verse 6. This knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too lofty for me to attain. But David wasn't afraid of this. He loved it. God being big was awesome. Then David just asks a question that he already knows the answers to. Uh, he just says, God, where can I go from your spirit? And where can I flee from your presence? Like, God, where could I go? You know, David already knew the answer to the question because when David was in the shepherd's field, see if you can finish my sentence, God was. You see, when David was on the battlefield and he was fighting Goliath, God was. You see, when David was running for his life from Saul, when Saul was throwing spears at David, when Saul wanted to kill David, when, when, Saul, was with, when Saul was within a few hundred yards of David, David knew that God was. You see, when David was on a run, when he was in a cave, God was. When David became king and when he ruled over the country, God was. So when David asks the question, God, where could I possibly go where you wouldn't be? He already knows the answer, but because he knows God is big, that is comforting to him, fully knowing that there is nowhere that he could possibly go. And so as he reflects on the bigness of God, the goodness of God, he pens down some thoughts that answers his own questions. I just love the fact that he was willing to get curious. Sometimes it's good to be curious. And he just writes down, he, and let's just read his own words. He, he answers his own questions. Let's just go for it. He goes, if I go up to the heavens, you are. If I made my bed in the depths, you are. If I rose on the wings of dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even your hand, God, will guide me. You are so big. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. Why? Because you're God. And the night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. And I know that you are full well. Basically what David is saying is, God, you are There, you are omnipresent. You are present in all things. I want to tell you something this morning. When you woke up, God was there. And somebody on the other side of the continent going to bed today, guess where God was? He was there. At the exact same moment that Billy Graham took his last breath in a child born for the very first time was happening, guess who was there in both places? God, he was there. I want to tell you something, that there is no meeting that you will have to go to this week that God isn't. You know, one of the things that gets us all kind of out of whack is fear and anxiety. And what is the thing that Jesus tries to promote and tries to drive home with his disciples over and over and over again? He tells them to fear Why? Because he, he tells us, he goes, fear not because I am with. What is he saying? I'm present with you. Like this week, you don't have to fear anything. Why? Because God is present with Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for telling me he's with me. But I want to tell you something. He's with you too. God is present with you. There is nowhere you can go that he's not present with you. When fear and anxiety and doubt try to creep into your mind, tell him. You tell those things. You tell the enemy. Doesn't matter. God's with me. I just won. You just, bam, that's right. You just won the argument. You won the battle. Listen, God is present. But he's not just present with us. He's present on a global, global scale. He is all present at all times for all people, 24-7, 365, which is really the underlying point is this. Is as David communicates that God is really big. How big is God? God is so big, he knows more than Alexa. God is so big that he's with us. He's present at all times, everywhere. That's a good thing. How big is God? 
The last thing, the underpinning thing in all of this. Once I find it. Is that God is omnipotent. He is all powerful. See this morning you don't have to try to be all powerful because you're not. But there's one who loves you who is. And his love for you is so big that he allowed his son Jesus to go to the cross and Christ crimson blood dripping down that cross was a sacrifice that would wipe the deepest stain out of a stain of sin out of our lives out of my life out of your life and it liberated people on a global scale and when Jesus Christ walked out of the tomb ball game life available for all he is that powerful you see there is no illness that has ever been known to man that God cannot heal there is no guilt and shame that his blood cannot wipe away and death doesn't have the final word because he is all powerful and we get to benefit from it. If God is that big, if he's that powerful and we get to know him like that, how awesome is that? So I'm just going to be honest with you guys this morning. I need a big God. I need a God big enough to be able to deal with my craziness, when I have questions, when I have insecurities, I need a God big enough and loving enough to help me through that. When I enter life storms, I need a God big enough to be a refuge, to be a shelter from those places that I can go to and actually rest and to be comforted. I don't know how you feel, but I need a big God who will help me be courageous when all I want to do is run, who will remind me that even in spite of all my sins, he still loves me. And you want to know something? I can't do any of those things by myself. But I have found that God is so big that he has done all those things or he wouldn't be God. God's big. and God is good. And so I'll leave you with this. You're going to go to the store this week. And you're going to see some people, whether you're at the gas station or, or whether, um, you know, at Ridley's or Walmart or wherever you like to shop, get groceries. As you see the people in that store, even the ones that are holding you up in line, just understand God loves them even when they're holding you up. And next time you go to a big city and you see how big it is, just understand God's knowledge, God's love, God's power is big and God's presence is bigger than all of that. And he knows all the people in that city and he knows them by name. He can count the number of hairs on their head and some of us are making it easier on them than others. <laughs> but he's that all-knowing and he's that powerful. At the end of the day, God's just really big and that's a good thing. I, you're going to enjoy this week. You're going to enjoy this week's reading. Just live in his bigness and let me pray for us. Lord God, thank you for today and thank you for a chance to open up your word. Lord, I want to say thanks for a chance to just share with my friends today, to just be here today, to be able to share your love. And so now that we have uh, lifted song to you, now that we've drank deeply from your word and from your deep love for us, we are full to the brim. So much so that it overflows. May it spill into the lives of those that need it most this week. And give us the eyes to see in Jesus' name. Amen.